Welcome to the Wednesday, July 13th, 2022 meeting of the Burlington Board of Electric Commissioners. My name is Lori Lemieux and I'm the board clerk for the commission. The July <coughs> meeting is the Burlington Electric Commission's organizational meeting and the first order of business is to elect officers. At this time, I open the floor for nominations for chair of the commission. I'll nominate uh, Commissioner Stevens. Second. Second. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, we will move to a vote. By show of hands, please indicate your support for Gabrielle Stebbins. Of the four members present, three votes were cast in support of Gabrielle Stebbins. Congratulations, Commissioner Stebbins. I'll now turn the meeting over to you. Thank you, Clark. Uh, the next uh, officer for election would be the role of vice chair. Uh, is there a nomination for vice chair? Nominate uh, Commissioner Moody. In a second. Second. And all in favor, you can raise your hands. And Commissioner Moody is unable to attend tonight, but I will let him know that he's been volunteered. Uh, and, and presumably he's fine with that. And we also have the nomination of the clerk, if I recall. Uh, could we have a motion for someone? I nominate Lori. Is that? Yep. Lori Second. 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 Yep. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I forgot to ask if there were any other nominations for either seat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, so welcome uh, to the regular July monthly meeting um, for Burlington Board of Electric Commissioners. Um, it is July 13th at 5.30 p.m. And first up on the agenda is the agenda itself. Are there any modifications or changes or edits uh, suggested? Nope. Commissioner Herendine, you leaned forward. Nope, okay. Okay, so we'll move forward. Uh, up next then is the minutes of the June 8th, 2022 meeting. Um, if there are uh, substantive content related edits uh, that should be noted, this is a good time to raise them. If it's just, um, you know, uh, clerical uh, or spelling error, we can address that via email. Any, any changes that people see? Uh, so then if we could have a move to approve. I move to approve the minutes as given. And a second. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, you, yeah. And one abstain. <laughs> one, yeah. Well, one abstain, one not here. So three approved. So next we have the public forum. Uh, <clears throat> I see a name I'm not familiar with on Teams. I'm not sure if that's a member of the. Rodney's uh, with our team at McNeil. Hello, Rodney. Thanks for joining. Sorry if I don't know you and your face. I'm very disappointed in you. Thanks. Happy to be here. Thanks. Uh, and any other members of the public interested, as always, you can feel free to call our customer care team and also join every second Wednesday when we're here. Moving on, we have the Commissioner's Corner. This is a discussion. So. Uh, anybody have an item? I do have an item I want to raise, um, but first let's touch on if anyone else has something that they want to raise. Well, the only thing I was going to say was um, I meant to send an email to Jen Green. I saw that City of Chicago is giving away free bikes as a net zero energy thing. I don't know what the uptake is on some of the other incentives, but I wonder if that's something to consider. I don't know. I thought it was interesting. Free. Free. 500 free bikes. That's a good price. No, they're giving out 500 bucks. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, because I think it's hard sometimes to get people to buy. I, I know local motion and or maybe old spokes home, they do donating. Um, yeah, for 200 bucks. I don't know what the incentive is for the e-bikes, which I used and love my e-bike, but um, probably could get a bike for that amount too. Do we know it? I'm sorry, I was typing. <laughs> Potential net zero energy strategy. Chicago is giving away some free bicycles as part of their <laughs> net zero strategy. Okay, I don't know that we have any mechanism or, or way to do that, but do we know? Okay. So I thought it was fun. Yeah. Um, 
anything else? Otherwise, I have two items. Nope. So one is, uh, and, and we can touch back on this at the commissioner's check-in, but one is uh, just to check in with regards to an August meeting. Um, years past, sometimes we have not met, and um, last year we did meet uh, still in the middle of COVID and, and keeping an eye on the budget. Um, wondering from uh, Darren and the crew what your thoughts are on August, um, and we'll also see where the conversation goes from the commissioners, but in terms of workflow, in terms of budget, in terms of any critical votes coming up, We've um, planned around not having an August meeting, so number of items that you have this evening, uh, more items coming in September. Uh, of particular note, the presentation of the Triennial Customer Survey uh, by Michael Moser from UVM. So triennial, but we haven't actually done it since 2017 because of the pandemic. So it's been almost five years, and the data is very interesting. So we'll have that for you in September, um, but we don't have any planned items or votes at this point for August. Okay. Uh, any thoughts initially from commission members? About August meeting? Yeah. yeah I, I did want to. Okay. So at the end of this meeting, we can make a decision. Uh, if, if it seems like there's nothing critical, then we can plan to not meet in August. But let's go through tonight's meeting and see if anything percolates. The other item I wanted to just mention is so... Uh, uh, at least a year, maybe a year, maybe nine months now, we've been talking about, um, we've heard from some uh, Burlington residents about um, how much uh, new street light uh, lighting they're experiencing. Um, as a recap for folks who might just be joining on this uh, <coughs> meeting, Back in January or February, uh, the commission asked the Burlington um, Electric Department team to reach out to IES, the Illuminating Engineer Society Standards Society, uh, that uh, essentially is a volunteer entity that sets the standards um, by uh, multiple experts in the field. Um, and they did not necessarily respond all that much to our feedback uh, or to our questions of when might these standards be updated? Can you give us some feedback as to what 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 the most recent standard is? We did connect with them um, a little bit in, and Andy, I might ask you to fill in um, if I'm getting any of this wrong, but please do come up. We did uh, get some feedback and uh, at the last meeting, we all heard that um, a, a new set of standards had been uh, rolled out that was 600 plus pages. Um, so at the last meeting we said, okay, that's a lot. Hey, Andy and your team, go back and read it and see if we can make some modifications and changes. Um, and we'll check back in on this in September. Between the last meeting and this meeting, uh, we had a couple of uh, South End counselors reach out to us because they had heard uh, new updated um, complaints and concerns. Um, and so we had a conversation, Commissioner Herendine and myself, so it was not a quorum, um, along with Andy and Darren and Paul and, and a few others, as well as the two counselors. And in some, we, we talked about essentially what we talked about last month, um, except there was a little bit more discussion about what the policy is that this commission um, has, you know, some jurisdiction over in terms of if we wanted to modify it or change it. Um, the policy right now basically says that we will follow the IES standards is my assumption, right? Correct. Okay, so one of the things that I recall being discussed, and it sounds like it maybe wasn't, maybe this wasn't everybody's recollection from other folks in the meeting. I was hearing um, some of the counselors, or one of the counselors say that we could decide as a commission to modify that policy to say, if it is a residential street that has had the same lighting for, you know, 80, 90 years, or however long, um, that we could change it so we could say that it's it doesn't it mu it, it doesn't necessarily have to be updated to IES standards. Um, that was what I heard, and I thought I thought that I uh, we had talked about having um, 
our the BED lawyer take a look at the language, even though that would be kind of um, probably not all that successful because he would probably say that it's still a risk and still a liability. That was my recollection of the meeting. Um, I understand that now you've been through all the standards and there's some additional updating, but before I transfer it to Darren and Andy, um, Commissioner Herendine, does my summation of that meeting, uh, do you want to add anything to it or is that essentially um, what you heard? That's essentially what I heard, um, but I did volunteer at the end of the last meeting and I restated that during the meeting with the two commissioners that I would do some homework uh, to report by September to the commission, and I will. Uh, the particular question was, are there examples out there of communities that have backed away from the recommendations from the IDS uh, successfully? So uh, that's a bit of a precedent, which uh, may be out there, and I will look for it and report on it. Okay. I started. Yes. Sorry. Oh, along that line, sorry, one more comment. Uh, I would like some time to have a look at the book, uh, RP 4322, that's the new, uh, the new uh, recommendations. Do we have a copy? It is a PDF. It's copyrighted. Right. But we could certainly show okay, it to so you. Is there a way I can uh, get that, or do I have to come in and look at it on the screen in PED or what? I think given that it's copyrighted material, I might have to show it to you on a screen, but I'm certainly happy to do that. All right, I'll be in touch. Okay. Darren, do you want to chime in and Andy with your thoughts and um, feedback from the meeting? Yes. Um, so I similarly recall there was a suggestion during the meeting that the commission has the authority to look at changing standards. Um, I know Commissioner Herendine's looking at whether other communities are still following IES, and we were gonna follow up on that in September. Um, the couple things I wanted to mention is subsequent to that meeting, uh, Andy and his team finished reviewing some of the IES standards, found that, and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, uh, found that the sidewalk standards are lesser now, right, than the right. prior standards. Uh, one of the communities where we had had uh, concerns raised uh, was Scarf Avenue. Um, we, I believe, are going to be able to reduce the number of fixtures from 23 down to 14 as a result of those new standards, which we've communicated uh, via letter to the residents on July 5th. So I'm not 100% certain that a policy change is necessary to accomplish the goal of reducing the lighting uh, that was affecting some of the residents at their homes. I don't know that they'll know until we finish the project whether they're satisfied or dissatisfied. We can carry that standard out now in further projects. I think in terms of advice from our council, uh, the advice would continue to be that if, if the department is tasked with doing the street lighting, which we are, um, that we need to follow a standard and have a process for implementing it, uh, which is currently we do if we're doing any upgrades on the street, we look at the street lighting, or if somebody calls us to complain that there's not enough street lighting, we'll do a study. Um, so I'd be reluctant to move ahead with a policy change, at least prior to being able to implement the new IES standards at uh, places like SCARF and see if it addresses the concerns. Um, I also am just conscious that the department doesn't necessarily seek to have this responsibility. It's been placed on us uh, by the city. <laughs> but given that, we have uh, certain liability standards that we need to, to meet. Um, so I, just, I, I would recommend that if we're considering any kind of policy change at September or any subsequent meeting, uh, we invite Bill Ellis back just to be able to uh, provide advice. And um, I don't know, Andy, if you have other. May, may I ask a question first? So it's gone from 23 to 14, but that's right. an increase of how much from current standards? Do you recall what SCARF had? SCARF did not meet any standards prior to the project, so Sorry. it had. Yeah. Sorry, how, how, many, how many light poles are there along SCARF now? Currently, there are 23 because we completed the project. So you're asking how many were there prior to the project? Yes. Okay, sorry. I believe there was one per block, so there was a total of two on the section in, in question. So I guess my point is it's still uh, an increase from 2 to 14. Um, my guess is the SCARF folks, th so you've completed that project. They have 23 currently, or how many do they have currently? Yes, currently 23. So we're basically going in and taking out nine. 
Correct. Um, so my guess is they'll feel better with that, but I still recall, uh, because it'll be less than what it's been. Um, moving forward though, for other streets that might only have two, um, what I recall us talking about with the counselors was, uh, you know, if, if there haven't been complaints and um, this has been the status quo, is there is there uh, a discussion to be had around grandfathering that in in some way? Um, and my, the besides Scarf, do you have any other streets that are currently? What I'm trying to ask is, if we don't touch this until September, after Commissioner Heron Dean has done his research, etc., if we don't touch this until September, are there other streets that were like Scarf that only had two that you will be updating to 14 in the next two months or three months? We would be starting the project. So we had the next project in the queue would be Lyman Avenue, which is the next street up from Scarf. Um, the work is starting on that street, but we wouldn't be installing the lighting until later, probably the spring okay. or That's winter I, at the earliest. So, okay. So we time. do we have some time? Yeah. Thank you. And the other streets uh, that we heard about last year, um, Home Richardson, mm -hmm. are is the plan to go back and yes. we're currently in the process of reevaluating those streets with the new standards, and similarly, we're seeing that we can reduce the output of the fixtures and in some cases even remove them. So the plan is to go back and implement that as well over the next few months. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, can I uh, ask also on Lyman, you say the lights wouldn't go in until the spring, but would you be putting poles in before that? No. We would be putting uh, some underground conduit in where the lights would be planned to go, but we wouldn't actually install the the poles and the fixtures until later. It's just still a bit of cost associated with doing that as well, I assume. Yes. But you have to do the, that regardless if you have yeah, the, two lights or 14 or 23. Correct. And we're also, the, the main project is to install electrical infrastructure on the street. So that's the bulk of the work that's going on. Uh, so first of all, I hear this is you prefer not to do this job, um, Darren, and, and it's uh, or not prefer not to, but it is something that you are required to do in the concern about liability. I do hear that. And I also have to say it's much to my chagrin that we followed the standards and then the standards were updated. And so now we're pulling them out because it's like, ah, uh, that's also waste. On the other hand, um, at least we will be addressing to some degree um, you know some of the concerns that we've heard thus far so thank you because I know it's going back around and around and around and that's always really fun um, so I could you guys I could you guys could one of you send the Commission um, what the policy is so that we can look at the policy and just see what the link where in the language um, you know, highlight the portion of the language that basically says we will be following the IES standards. And then the, my other question was, if we if we can still have Bill Ellis, um, as much as he's going to say no, thank you, but um, draft up something to the degree of what it would be like if we were to grandfather in those other you know existing streets with the, with their street light. I think uh, we can send the street lighting policy certainly, um, and we'll follow up, Andy. If you can send it to Lori, Lori can uh, share it with the entire commission. Um, in terms of Bill, I think the drafting likely wouldn't be significant, but I think he'd want to come and talk about it. Um, I don't know that he would want to draft something that he feels wouldn't uphold the department's standards without having a conversation first. Okay. If well, so okay for now, if you him. can send it. Um, and uh, although we may not meet in August, if we could all plan on reading it, um, and if you could highlight like I said, that the portion that would be specific to this policy standard, um, that would be helpful in terms of automatic updating to the IES standards, if you can highlight that portion. Um, and would you like us to add Bill for the September meeting? Uh, could you FYI him? I don't want to ask him to come and pay for him to come if it turns out that Commissioner Heron Dean needs more time or what not why don't we we'll tentatively get it on his calendar okay. and if um if it turns out this is an agenda item and we're ready i'd like to have him there but if not 
uh, we can always let them know to postpone if that's okay. Well, let me also say, committee again, uh, the debt that I intend to go into, I can certainly deliver, let's say by the 1st of September. Great. Um, and Lori, if it's possible, um, once you've drafted up the meeting minutes for this portion, could you share that with the two counselors, um, Councillor Shannon and um, Councillor um, Travers? Mm -hmm. Travers. 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 Yep. Sure. Uh, and you can CC me on that. Thank you. Because uh, then I'll, that'll prompt me to follow up with them. Do commissioners have any questions? Yeah. I do. Um, so one question is, do you, there's no public, in, public engagement that's required. Like if you go and you put in 23 electrical poles, you don't have to tell people that you're doing that or, cause I guess I, so they that, do tell, I mean, they send letters and yes. people yeah. are notified before it happens. Yeah, we do. We do make a point of doing some outreach beforehand, you know, before we even start the project, just to let folks know that this is coming. Okay. And we provide our contact information if they have questions or feedback or anything like that. So, so, so you said we're going to do this. Let us know. You got thirty days, forty-five days. Nobody says anything. The polls go in, and then you get the phone call. Yeah. And then the other thing that kind of concerns me a little bit is, you know, it's the squeaky wheel syndrome a little bit. I, I mean, I, probably it's very dramatic if there were two polls and then there were twenty-three. I don't don't dispute that. But sometimes the people don't are some. They're not speaking for everybody. Right. Right, and then that is also something that we need to consider because I know that that neighborhood. I don't know. Last summer they had a lot of car break-ins and tires being slashed and things like that. So it just I think we're in a very precarious position, right? Like I get the counselors are involved because people are making calls, but um, they had an opportunity. I mean, this is this yeah, it's a little frustrating. I I, I would imagine. <laughs> Especially it's, going back and ripping them out. It's true that not all feedback has universally been negative. Yes, we did get oh. some positive. There feedback. are some oh, who feel did. positive yes. about. That's helpful to know. Yeah. I have not gotten any of that. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same reason that you're pointing out. It's, people don't tend to overshare the positive feedback as much as, as yeah. negative feedback. And we're respectful of the, the feedback that we're getting. Uh, you know, if we weren't able under the new IES standards to do something to address the challenge, um, then I think uh, we, would, we would be forced to look at the policy change if we wanted to do something. I think we're fortunate in a way that there is now flexibility so we can at least demonstrate to folks that we've heard them that we can go in and change the infrastructure, see if it addresses uh, the majority of concerns. And um, you know, we'll know that hopefully soon uh, with some of these streets. And so did you have to get a certain number of signatures of the people on the street in order to make this? No, because we're just following policy. It's a city policy. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, but if you were going to grandfather in old streets, then you might want to get the street might want to weigh in as a, as an entity. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, th those are questions to ask. Yeah, I guess, Commissioner Herndon, if to the degree that you find information uh, pertaining to uh, what Commissioner Whitaker was just asking, you know, what type of public outreach support was there? Um, that could be helpful. Because if the point of, if the point of your research is to say if we're going to if we're going to think about this seriously, um, to look at what other communities have done, uh, then having that additional information would be helpful as a guidance as to how we may or may not decide to move forward. Other comments. Okay. Thanks. I, I know that was a very long um, commissioner's <laughs> corner, but we don't get a lot of public feedback, and it, it's one of the items that we've actually heard about um, multiple occasions, although it's great to hear that people are also happy um, with the additional lighting. So, uh, and some. <laughs> well, yes, some people. Uh, and again, thank you, because I know it's uh, literally going around in circles, uh, but I appreciate it. Um, anything else for Commissioner's Corner? Now that Gabrielle made up her own agenda item. <laughs> okay, so next up, General Manager's update. Well, Thank the good you. news is this was in the update, so we can skip that portion of it <laughs> um, in the interest of being efficient. Um, uh, we are working on a report uh, due for the July 18th meeting of the City Council. 
uh, BED and the Department of Permitting and Inspections uh, about initial thoughts relative to the charter change that was passed, um, what we might do with building policy for new construction for large existing commercial. Um, the drafting the report is in real time at the moment, um, and uh, we'll gladly share a copy with the commission uh, when it is final. Uh, we've had a good process with the Building Electrification Institute looking at policies in Boston, New York, and Denver, all of which have different variations that we can look at drawing from. Um, we're conscious that this has only been a couple months since the charter change passed and the city council issued a resolution. So uh, there will be some significant additional public process and policy research uh, prior to us uh, making any final recommendations to the city council. But interim report due on the 18th. And I uh, just wanted to flag that for the commission. Um, in terms of uh, public events, we have a number of public events, busy time of year for us. Um, we were at the Lake Monsters last week. I'm pleased to share that I was able to get the first pitch over the plate. Uh, Tom Messner was razzing me a little bit, but uh, we, we got it done. Uh, and um, uh, Mike Kanarik and I were there with our colleagues from VGS uh, tabling at our customer night. We had a lot of customers who showed up um, for that. We have uh, tomorrow night, uh, Somervale, Chris Burns, Jen Green and I will be there uh, and we'll be tabling there. Uh, have the Chevy Bolt maybe? Yep, uh, people, people coming up and asking about the Chevy Bolt, the BED labeled one quite a bit. Um, those are, I think at 26,000 now for uh, 2023, they've received a significant discount. So it's one of the most affordable vehicles period and it happens to be electric with pretty good range. And so people are interested in that. Um, we have a table at the Old North End Farmer's Market next week. Adam Rabin and Jen Green will be there for that. Uh, and um, just a reminder, uh, the, the free bicycles kind of brought this up again for me, uh, that we will have our September Net Zero Energy Festival uh, planned for the 17th with the rain date of the 24th. Uh, we're going to have e-bike and EV test rides there. Uh, vendors uh, from our heat pump partners. Uh, Champ will be making an appearance. We have two live musicians and a DJ, uh, fossil fuel free food trucks and drink carts, um, and a variety of kids activities, uh, touch a truck uh, with our BED bucket trucks, Power Town. Uh, so we're excited to do this with the community. Uh, it'll be from nine to one on September 17th, and we'll be working on advertising uh, the event publicly uh, in the month of August to make sure people are aware of it. Um, so we're looking forward to that. I think we're trying to get a bike uh, tune-up station as well for that. That's why the free bicycles uh, uh, had touched a uh, place in my mind. And I think we're not going to have free bicycles, but I think we're going to try to have a few giveaways uh, with raffle, uh, potentially a free giveaway electric mower, and uh, maybe one other uh, opportunity for a Green Ride uh, membership. So a couple of nice Net Zero related items. Um, in terms of uh, budgets, rates, uh, and, and the IBEW contract item, um, so we're in fiscal 23. We've implemented the uh, fiscal 23 budget. Uh, council approved that uh, in June. Um, our rate case, uh, our, our surcharge is scheduled to take effect in August for the 3.95% uh, rate change while the rate case is pending at the PUC. Uh, we have our filing in for the energy assistance program update to move to the 12.5% from the 7.5%, which you all have approved previously. Um, we have a new four-year contract uh, with the IBEW. Uh, there will be a signing event in this room on July 27th at 10.30. Uh, commissioners welcome to join if they're interested. Uh, we'll have the mayor and Jeffrey Wilmette from IBEW and formally sign that. Uh, contract. We appreciate the uh, the work we did with IBEW. Appreciate their partnership in reaching that agreement. Um, and then, lastly, uh, in June we had a letter agreement uh, among BED, VGS, the City of Burlington, UVM, UVM Medical Center, the Intervale Center, and Evergreen Energy uh, to guide our further work on district energy over the next uh, six to nine months. Um, the goal here is to. Uh, do a number of things, including uh, fully form the nonprofit entity that would be Burlington District Energy that would be operated by Evergreen and would manage the project, including permitting, financing, construction, and operation if we reach a go decision. Uh, we're going to try to get updated financial information through the course of the end of the year, um, updated construction pricing, financing rates. Uh, James is going to be working on some updated uh, fuel-related pricing uh, as well. Um, we, we were clear about there are some headwinds in regards to all of those items. And so we're hoping that by the end of the year, 
uh, some of the impacts of rising rates and inflation on construction and other things uh, are able to be addressed uh, in a favorable way. Um, we're also in the process of a uh, significant amount of paperwork to uh, receive the $5.166 million from Senator Leahy. Uh, the council approved accepting that grant and had a resolution uh, supporting formation of the 501c3 for the district energy nonprofit. Um, so a number of items related to district energy are, are underway. Significant amount of work that'll be uh, happening over the next six to nine months under that letter agreement. And uh, further forward motion with some economic headwinds uh, with that project, but um, quite a bit of work happening. And that's all I've got. Good that it's moving forward, but still not quite a go or no go decision. Not yet. Um, I anticipate end of 22, early 23, we'd be in a position to make that uh, decision with partners. Um, and it's going to be, I, I don't want to uh, speculate too much, but I think the engineering and design is, is largely in a good place. And so I think it's going to be an economic uh, decision and uh, factors will be what they are. Um, but it, this gives us some time to have uh, some, some factors hopefully turn in our favor. We do have a federal grant pending that we can applied for competitively. Uh, that we're hoping to hear from uh, the federal government about, which would uh, further enhance the economics on the project if it was successful. Is the global turmoil and um, upheaval with regards to energy costs, and just in terms of the fact that we can't control them at all, um, helping to sway any of the potential concerns about, oh, you know, gas has historically been low, but when it's not, you know, has that helped at all? I think it's true that the delta between uh, conventional gas and either district energy or other renewable fuels like renewable natural gas has gotten smaller uh, because of the upwards pressure on natural gas as a commodity. So that would be uh, something that might favorably impact the economics of the project, certainly. Um, the idea that you would have a hedge against uh, fuel price volatility by being part of the district energy project, also absolutely a plus. Um, I think our challenge is to get a price structure that really uh, tries to minimize uh, the impact of volatility on the district energy price. I think that's something that James is going to be working on. Um, uh, if it was, you know, if it was based on forwards in the ISO New England market, that's not very helpful at the moment. Uh, those are, are incredibly high. Uh, for winter, uh, and we're very high last winter. Uh, so looking at something that's tied in a different way is something that we're interested in. Obviously, the, the one impact that we're seeing is diesel prices do impact uh, wood chip prices. And so we're seeing that, I don't think to the extent that we're seeing the pressure on, on gas commodity costs, but uh, there's upward pressure in a variety of areas. I think, to your point, the overall delta has probably moved somewhat in favor of the project uh, in recent months. May I ask? Um, it it mentions a global leadership program. What um, what was that? Oh, this is in policy and planning. Just curious. Was that your program, James? That was my program I was attending. With the <laughs> World Affairs Council, Institute? World Affairs yep. did a global leadership program that ran over eight months, and I was accepted into it. And it just ended in June. Was it good? It was good. Um, I mean, you know, it wasn't quite what I expected. I expected it to be more engagement with global leaders and less engagement with U.S. leaders about global engagement. Um, but it was still very well done. The speakers were excellent, and you certainly got exposed to a large variety of viewpoints. So, so again, and they've asked us if we want to uh, offer anybody up for the next, this was the first year, so the next iteration of the program. Thanks. Uh, and I did just want to ask how the multifamily EV charger, because that's really hard to, that's just such a challenging nut to crack in terms of, is it per spot? Is it, you know, one unit? And, you know, how do you manage payment? How did that soft launch go? So, and James, I don't know if you have more detail on this. My, my understanding was um, we had approval from the PUC to do the uh, 50 to 60 additional uh, through the EV match program. Uh, we're kind of using that soft launch to reach out to customers. We have 14 installed already. Uh, the software is great because it allows you to set it for 
certain times of the day for residents, certain times for the public and, and set the charge and you show up on the PlugShare website. Uh, so people who are searching for an EV charger know that you're available. Um, I don't know what indications of interest. I know last time we were oversubscribed uh, when we had the initial 14. So I'm assuming we'll have a pretty strong level of interest. Uh, and then just the other thing I'd mention is we just signed the grant agreement for uh, state of Vermont that we can put in the five uh, street light uh, EV charger level twos uh, that are going to be going in in areas that we've identified as being a uh, higher percentage of low income and higher percentage of renters. I think largely kind of in the downtown South End uh, area as well as the old North End. So we'll have five new level twos going in through that grant. But I don't know if you know anything about the uptake on the well the pilot was done and we've just done the soft launch in like june so i would have to check and get that information and i think the act 151 <coughs> reallocation of the funds is still pending too we were planning we were planning to move some of our uh preferred dealer program funds into multifamily charging because the dealers right now basically can't get the cars so we were looking to reallocate some of those and we're waiting for approval to move those funds which would allow us to do more of them It'll be interesting to see how that uh, how that pans out because it is it is just so tricky. You know, if it's street parking, where do you you know? That's why the light poles are going right. to be, I think, critical. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, but not if they pull them out though. Okay. Right. <laughs> Different light poles, I think, not the ones Andy's. <laughs> yeah, the, utility the, poles. Yeah, that's we just executed. Well, parking. Yeah, I would always. Yeah, <laughs> the parking could be an issue too. Yeah, totally. Yes, true point as well. Yes. <laughs> So, yeah, we had actually proposed three and they gave us five. We, we actually proposed five and expected to get three and we got five locations for the multifamily street side EV charging. We had to make a couple of modifications because the statewide contract was structured around people who didn't have electric rates and things like that. You know, so we had to make a few adjustments, but it has been signed as of today. I'm happy to check on the status of the soft rollout and get back to you in August. No, July, September. September. So, yeah, and, uh, well, July. Darren, and, Darren and I would be willing to come back in August, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, sorry. Where are the um, light poles going? Uh, I have a map. They're mostly in the old north end, um, but I think there's one on Pine Street, too. It was done. Um, Freddie and Tom Lyle from my team yep. basically took a, a demographic overlay of income levels, housing, you know, multi-unit housing, and looked for locations that would work with DPW and selected five on that basis. So, again, there's a map, and I'm happy to provide that. Are they uh, in? Maple King, Pine Street area. Are they in already? No, 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 oh, no. We no, just okay. signed the grant okay. today, but we they're, the they're being yet. largely funded by the state grant. Okay. So, over the next year, we'll be getting yeah. those in. Okay. Uh, it's a multi year grant, but right. yeah, hopefully. It's a cool year. project. That was when you were talking about the multifamily charging. I was like, why don't you just put them in the light poles? But yeah. We are. <laughs> five of them at least. Five. I think they're five double heads. Yes. So and it's then, 10 charging points. Yeah, it's perfect. It's a pilot, so if they work out well, we can pursue. Yeah. But there were just some funny things like, you know, make sure that you can park, you know, that, that you're, you, you facilitate nose to tail parking. It's like, I'm not going to get involved in the parking ordinances in Burlington, you know, so, you know, special special street uh, snow clearing. It's like, well, we, we can't really do that. You know, so there, there had to be some amendments to the contract, but they were very, the state was very accommodating. We fixed those things and signed it today. Was this ACCB for the grant? Yes. I, I ask about this because I sat in all those, I sit on house transportation, so I sat in on all those. They, they were very accommodating. You know, again, like I say, we've got the draft contract. It's like, you know, we'll file a tariff. It's like, uh, got one, you know, so. Uh, and then just, I, I trust you guys are doing this, but for Burlington Future High School, you guys are going to try and make that as net zero energy as possible. Yes. Chris is on it, um, along with other members of our team. I think we're exploring a variety of options. Can I mention, is it? Uh, okay. So we're looking at geothermal. Cool. That's what we Sounds promising. Great. Yeah, and I think transportation is also important for the new high school because they're building it in a very antiquated. The last plans that I saw were pretty much like suburban style. Assumed that people and give preference to cars over the the bus, and the bus carries many more students and things like that. They weren't that amenable when we, I talked to them earlier, and they weren't that interested in listening. But I don't know now. I know Jen is on, and actually my wife is on it as well. The design committee that's providing feedback. So I know Jen Green's offered some feedback on uh, transportation, I think, through that medium as well. Um, we have less to do f with from an incentive standpoint, yeah. Yeah. unless they're looking at EV chargers or uh, things like that. But uh, I know she shared comments relative to the net zero plan as well. Emily, did you have? That was the point. Oh, OK. Yeah, Tr transportation sometimes falls between the cracks, I think, because nobody really owns it. 
um, but it's important too, yeah. Yeah, that was one of the reasons why it would be great to have it more downtown, but moving on. As a new North Ender, I can't object, but. <laughs> okay, uh, so financials. Wait, you're done? I am done. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, it's when I read this report, there's just so much going on. So thanks to the whole team. All right. Let me share my, oh, hopefully I can figure it out. Share my screen. All right, um, before I pull up the actual numbers, I thought I would talk about, there's sort of a funky anomaly happening in the May financials. Um, so it's been mentioned in a lot of the updates from finance and policy and planning over the last couple months, but we have an accounting change that's gonna go into effect related to how we account for um, renewable energy credits in that we are shifting. Historically, what we've done is when we buy renewable energy credits, we expense them in the month that we purchase them and then that's sort of all that we do on the financials. The change that we're making is we're actually going to, um, they're effectively an asset because they're good for three years in terms of when we have to sort of turn them in. So we've changed it so that we're gonna quali qualify them as inventory when we purchase them, and then they will, we'll expense them based on what our compliance is for that year. So there is a shift that's happening. We bought a good number of, that we found, James's team found some cheap wrecks. We bought a good amount in May. Cheap is a relative term. Cheap is relative, right? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, bought a good number of wrecks last month, or no, in May, and we expensed all of them in the month of May. We are gonna have to, we're gonna make an adjustment in, we decided not to make the adjustment in May because we're gonna have to do a year end true up in June. So there's gonna be a, sh a change in June to the tune of about half a million dollars. So it is a significant, um, it makes the financials look like we're in worse position than we actually are, but it's going to change in June. The FY22 year-end financials will be updated. It was just sort of, it was the end of May. We got one month ago. I make sort of extra work on this. So this financial analysis, it's helpful for all the other perspectives, but sort of that bottom line number is definitely going to shift when we get to June. So I'll walk through it, but wanted to put that out there before we got into the numbers. Um, um, it sounds like this is essentially an accounting difference, not yes. a real financial difference. Yeah, that's true. Even for the fact that we're holding them as inventory for three years. Yeah, so they'll they won't be expensed in the years. So they won't show up on the income statement. Um, so our net income for the year won't be impacted. It will like they were historically. It will sit on the balance sheet as a an asset to the agency or to the department. Cool. So with that said, I will dive right in. Um, as you can see, it's pretty um, apparent when you look at it. So for the um, month, the net income was $274,000 as compared to a budget of $1.34 million. Um, so it shows we're a million dollars under, but that's really, um, if you adjust that by half a million, really only about half a million under budget. Um, and so for the year, this also shows that we're 173,000 under, but if you adjust, we're actually to the good for the month. Um, just going down quickly. Wait, can, I'm confused because this is till May. I thought you said you were making that change in June. We are going to make the change in June. So the May reflects us expensing the full purchase of the renewable energy credits. In June, we're going to undo the expense and move it into inventory. So it will just uh, be, okay. It'll just be the expense will reflect just the amount that we need to comply, not the full purchase that we did this past month. So you could add five hundred thousand to the net income, and instead of a 173 variance negative, it'd be a 300 some odd. Right. Uh, positive. positive. Okay. Um, so real quick, running through sort of the month end, um, it was a good month for sales to customer, both residential and commercial were up. Residential was up. The majority of that um, above budget variance was due to residential to the tune of about $100,000. Um, other revenues were down about $91,000, primarily driven by EEU. Um, every month, that's generally what it is. Um, and similarly, the power supply revenue um, was down 28,000. This is due to that sort of underproduction that we've talked about um, in prior months and how that comes through. Um, so this, the power supply expense line is where that half a million dollars, that um, change is. 
Um, there is also the ISO exchange line was about $581,000 over budget. There was underproduction at, if you'll recall, May. Um, McNeil was offline in May, so there was underproduction at McNeil. There was also some underproduction um, at Winooski 1 and in our wind contracts. Um, the fuel was under budget, similarly, because McNeil wasn't producing, so we didn't expense as much fuel. Um, and our operating expenses were about 58000 um, over budget last month. Um, taxes, same story as it's been every month. The pilot change has really benefited us. So we've got that again, um, almost half a million dollars for the year. And um, our other income was under budget again, just due to lower anticipated customer contributions, which is really just timing of when we budgeted for those um, customer contributions to come in to when they're actually, um, when projects are finished and those funds come in. Um, so if, if once you do the true up, it would be 300 something or so in terms of um, net income for um, through May, uh, any sense of where June will land since we won't be here in August? <laughs> it is June takes a little bit longer because it's year end. We want to make sure we get every invoice process, get everything done um, so that we can we're in a good place when we jump into audit, which they emailed today. We're going to start that process now. So. So and then I have a couple questions. Are, do you feel like the um, pandemic, the sales, the disruption to the sales, has that more or less pan evened out? I think the right our sort of total sales number. Well, because uh, like. Uh, um, uh, commercial customers was way down, right? And residential was more or less the same or up, but they weren't paying, you know, we're having tr trouble with uh, collections. So is that all kind of evened itself out? Um, I'd have to look more at the, the data um, to be honest. I don't know off the top of my Because it looks like you're doing great on the budget. And I just, I can't remember, like, was the budget change from, presumably it was, right? Because you're in the middle of a pandemic. You don't forecast as if there wasn't a pandemic. Mike Leach had kind of incorporated the new normal. Uh, Emily can add to this if she wants um, into the forecast. Yeah. So, you know, previous years we had looked at it like what would normal year be minus a certain percent, and I think the kind of variability from the pandemic is now reflected more in the underlying sales forecasts. Um, that's uh, yeah, that's that's correct. We actually for the FY twenty two budget for sales to customers we sort of assumed a continuing slight depression in sales net residential and commercial together through the current, through the whole fiscal year. Um, and if you look at the slide that's in your packet that shows the kilowatt sales to customers budget versus actual over the year, I'm going to pull up that one right there. You can see that our guess was, was pretty, pretty close. Good, yeah. Right? So sometimes we've overshot, sometimes it's been under, but on average, um, you're correct that we are continuing to see residential a little bit more than the pre-COVID normal. And we're and commercial has been kind of like at predicted levels or maybe a little bit below, but not substantially below like we saw in the early March days. March 2020, yeah. Commercial is, is sort of pretty much back, you know, generally speaking, to where we'd expect it to be. And then we're kind of con continuing to see that residential bump from the sort of work at home, school at home phenomenon that COVID brought. And we're actually in our sales forecast sort of like projecting that to kind of continue to be the way that people behave that affects their electricity consumption in their homes. So we've budgeted for a sort of a modest residential increase in the FY23 sales budget assuming that's going to persist as a trend. Do we know, is there an estimated forecast as to when, um, I don't even know what to call it anymore, city place, town, you know. Mm -hmm. The mall, uh, when that might be completed in any sense of like what that would do to sales? I'm, I'm guessing that's two years out at least. I think Chris has the best intelligence <laughs> that anybody has. Um, I will say that we've not, because the plans have not become firm and known, we haven't incorporated it into our revenue projections yet. But you're correct that once we see some shovels and earth moving, um, we will, and it will make a substantial change to the, the revenues. And I would add to that that the city's electrification or, or renewable spacing ordinance will apply to that project. Ah. So, um, but what we're hearing from the design team, the early design team, 
going to go deep on. So that'll be interesting to see what the, the impact is. Our understanding is the hotel version with a small amount of apartments with retail going above um, outdoor gear exchange down to the LL Bean is phase. That's one project where the whole is um, is a separate project where most of the housing happened. But we're looking at a an unknown timeline for occupancy. Have you tested any wells there? Are you okay? Um, <laughs> not yet. No. Okay. Could be interesting. Yeah, I mean, because Champlain College is sort of the same type of area, and they had some wells, so. They do. Yes. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, collections too. Has that evened out as well? Is there data in this? The collections are. We did the the rearage. Um, use the ARPA funds. They are about double where they were in February of 2020. That's because we're sort of starting to move into that disconnect piece. So I think it's, we haven't done the disconnects yet. So that hasn't started to drop off yet. So there is a rearages associated with disconnects that haven't happened, but they are sort of moderate. They were the same in April or in May and June, they were similar amounts. So we sort of bought them down and then they've kind of leveled off so far. Sure. Um, I'll just quickly jump back. Um, right, so year to date, um, we're ahead on the sales to customers, right? That no, you know, residential is up a million, non-residential is down a million, right? So we're like right where we thought we were gonna be an aggregate, but a little off sort of in the buckets um, of revenue. Um, similar, um, other revenues are down, mostly due to the EEUs stuff in the demand side management um, power supply revenues year to date are down seventy seven thousand dollars which is one percent um, so it's pretty good um, for the year um, similarly our on the expense side um, power supply is below budget by about seventy seven hundred and five thousand um, which is about two percent within budget fuels down purchase power is up a little bit and then transmission fees are down. Um, and then on the operating expenses, we're under budget by about a million dollars um, due to various things coming in under budget and the timing um, of projects. And then the last piece, we talk about this every month, but just to mention again, our other income is down about $2 million, um, both due to the ARPA assumptions, mm -hmm. but also the customer contributions and this, the timing of when those are coming in. On the, the capital side, um, we're about 55% of the budget to date. Um, say it again, right? Timing of projects, um, invoices for the McNeil overhaul came in, um, continue to come in sort of into June. So though there'll be more activity on that um, by year end. Um, and also there's you know a couple projects, including the Velco spending that's not gonna happen or that didn't happen in FY22, IT forward projects that won't occur and the bucket truck that we weren't able to procure. Um, last year, or in, yeah, last year, in 22. Um, so it was at the end of May, our cash was 11 million um, on May 30th compared to 11.2 million on April 30th, so still in great cash, cash position. Um, credit rating factors even before we make the change associated with the REC purchase um, are still in really good shape, so the debt service cover ratio was down slightly um, to, uh, was up slightly um, to 4.93 from 4.59. The adjusted ratio is at 1.33 and days cash on hand is at 140 days and it was at 139 um, in the prior month. Um, just as a, one thing we do know is that the year, at year end, our cash was about a million dollars ahead of where we had budgeted. Um, so we do know we don't have to wait for the final accounting to know where our cash position was on June 30th. So. That's all I've got. Any questions? So I just have a little question because I'm not, um, I'm used to different kinds of public agencies. And if sure. um, if you had a lot of cash in the bank, you can get in, like, people are like, why do you have all this money? Like, we're, you're charging, you know, so do you, ha is that a problem or not? Is 
Because you're think, a different entity. I think, you know, having a certain amount of cash on hand is important for the credit rating. Right, of course. Measure. Yeah. Um, so typically, we always want to be at 90 at a minimum. Uh, but right there, you're on the edge of A. So we like to have a, a cushion above that. And uh, certainly, if you had a incredibly large cash position that persisted over a long period of time, uh, you might get a, a regulatory concern around yeah. that, um, just in terms of whether you needed a uh, rate change, um, you know, for example. But I think, you know, looking at these metrics, and I know that we'll get um, uh, improvement modestly in the adjusted debt ratio based on the accounting change that Emily mentioned. We don't know what June holds, so we're kind of interested and anxious to learn what our year-end metrics look like. These are way healthier metrics than we saw, uh, particularly during the pandemic, but even pre-pandemic. And I think the rate change, as hard as that was to pursue, and then the strategy of having the more moderate follow-up uh, rate change has, has helped get us to this point where we're not right on the knife's edge of the A uh, metric, but we have some cushion. And I don't necessarily expect we'll maintain a 140 uh, days cash on hand uh, as we go through our capital spend in a given period of time, that will fluctuate. Um, but having the adjusted debt uh, where it is and trying to maintain or even improve it is a, is a real healthy thing for us in terms of keeping our A rating. So, so it's a rate increases plus maybe some capital projects proceeding more slowly than expected that's leading in to a larger cash. cash. Yes. So, but it's not going to be sustained over time. Supply chain may have impacted yeah, yeah, those capital course, projects. Those so our, our hope is we will catch shortages. up on yeah. capital. Yeah. We tend to underspend capital for a variety of reasons at this organization, but at the moment, supply chain seems to be the, the biggest challenge. Uh, Hello, uh, excuse me, folks. Are you seeing images a lot of me? You don't want to see either too big or too many. <laughs> you look great. I'm having, well, I'm having a tech problem. I see two images of me, um, and one of them fills half the screen. And anyway, there's no issue. Okay, never mind. I won't worry about it if you don't. And thanks for joining us. And thank you for the uh, special deal. Uh, let me just ask one of my standard questions. I know we don't know what the uh, energy use would be for the uh, city place Burlington or whatever it's called when it's finally finished. But uh, what we're talking about is if it's huge, or sorry, is if it's large compared with other demands, do we have a ballpark? Because I think I remember one from way back. I. I I don't know if we can, sh can we share in open session relative to kind of that metric? I, I recall what it was, but. Okay. I can handle it. I'll let you know I can handle it. Okay. Um, I think if we were thinking about a range, not for the new project, but in terms of what might come off the grid uh, with the old project uh, not being operational, my recollection was that's about a megawatt of demand. And Chris is shaking his head, uh, yes. Thank you. You heard that, right, Commissioner Herndine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, so I believe next up we are agenda item number seven. This is the 2022-23 strategic direction, and this is discussion and a vote. And I'll just start off with, um, uh, so it's three pages in the packet. <laughs> but it'll be one page on the You're website. You're going to, okay. <laughs> Have no fear. And, I, I, you know, looking at this, I just, I re did we never have um, under values anything like sustainability uh, we have sustainable in the mission uh, the values I think we had organized a few years back <clears throat> around the four centers uh, that we have at BED right okay um, yep okay and uh, we, there, there's no uh, substantive change here from what you saw in uh, June I did want to reiterate based on the discussion we had last time that when this goes up on the website we will uh, include a link to the PMR so that folks who are interested in the metrics uh, can get the latest metrics uh, in a given year uh, based on that. And 
Do you have a date for the PMR? Uh, it's up on the website. The Already? Okay. Yes. Um, so, the, But the July 18th report is related specifically to charter the charter change. change. Okay. Uh, and can you just show me, I had asked you to try and tweak one bit of language. And I'm not... Which one was that? Uh, uh, I will look for it. I'm not going to hold everybody up for it. Um, the, the note we had was that, um, uh, uh, looking back at the minutes anyhow, was that there was interest in having kind of a link for the real time, uh, not real time, but the metrics, the most updated metrics. Um, I don't think I had a language change, but if you have one, we can make an edit. No, that, I, I, will, I will pull it up. I don't need to waste everyone's time. Um, have folks had a chance to review the final version? Well, until next year. I did not. Okay. I've glanced through it. Yeah. Uh, and are, are people comfortable with it? Are, are there additional changes that people would want? Or is there a desire to move forward with the vote? I had a few comments. And of course, now I can't find my notes. So wait a minute. savings from heat pump technology. Um, I know that's what we're stressing now. Do we want to expand that into other technologies or just stick with it in the specific uh, ways there now? I think that was my comment as well. I think, if I'm remembering, Chris, was this from your team? Uh, uh, was there a uh, we've, we've talked a lot internally about heat pumps because they're such a significant measure and because understanding the cost savings in particular when we're competing against uh, natural gas, which has typically had favorable economics, has been so important to us. So we've talked about having a web tool. Um, in fact, I've worked with Building Electrification Institute specifically on a web tool for that technology. I don't think we're, we're not opposed to having other web tools as well. Is that the basis for it. Chris is going to come up to the mic, Bob. Hang on one second. That's essentially true. When you look at some of the tools that are out there for consumers for EVs, um, we felt that when you look at the roadmap, um, building electrification is, is tricky. With heat pumps in this climate going against natural gas, we felt a dedicated tool just to deal with the heat pump issue um, that was, you know, uh, helpful to customers was the reason for that and sticking to that technology. But as Darren said, you know, opening up to other technologies, that could be fine as well. Uh, I think your point is good. Uh, I'm carrying a bit of baggage, which I might have mentioned once before. The fight that I had once in my brief employee at the Solar Energy Research Institute when the uh, bugaboo that was thrown out was. Uh, a house in the northeast somewhere that had three inch walls and was covered with solar panels, which I think in those days were just thermal panels, they weren't electric panels. And the question was, was there an overall optimization um, over efficiency and uh, supply? And likewise, the question here, uh, 
efficiency as a cheaper uh, avenue instead of heat pumps. But if we don't put it in, it doesn't complicate life, and I'm all for simplification. So I can do. I can accept it as it is. But that's why I brought it up. And I remember this is what I brought up. I think last time around as well, because I was like, what about all the other technologies? And one of the comments was that, you know, uh, we don't necessarily, um, it's not as core to our business proposition, um, other technologies. That being said, it'd be great if you could do some thinking to this website tools, that there is some language about when you're electrifying a building, how, what optimization looks like and this tool is focused on heat pump heat pump technology but there's sort of a balancing act between you know how much air sling insulation do you do to address what you need to heat and cool the, the tool we're drafting right now allows you to model um, making it thermal envelope improvements for to exactly that point okay cool great well, then that argues, then that argues why, I know, we've been peppering you. You're going to be like, huh. That argues why only heat pump technology. I mean, you could say building electrification technologies. I, we don't need to go there. That's okay. Yeah. It, 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 we're, start, we're starting with what we think is the, the biggest and trickiest. Okay. Well, let's see how it goes, and we can revisit it next year. Okay. Okay, that's the only comment. Would anyone like to make a motion to approve or to not? I motion to approve the strategic plan. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, next up, we have the weatherization repayment assistance program filing. This is a discussion and a vote with James and Emily. I've been and, Chris. and Chris. This is why Chris is here. I was wondering this is why, why we are blessed with your company today. <laughs> okay. So, yes, I'm going to cue this up and give you an overview. And, um, Chris is here to speak to any programmatic questions you may have. He's been in the uh, person primarily engaged with BHFA and exploring and shaping this program. Um, and James is here uh, because this is probably going to be a PUC filing. Um, and the reason we're bringing it um, especially to you is that it may end up taking the form of a tariff. That's something we're still in discussion with VHFA and DPS about. Um, but if it does take the form of a tariff, we will need city council approval. And obviously, we'd want your approval first um, before we go to council. So this is a pilot on-bill financing program that will help um, low and moderate income customers pay for weatherization improvements. Um, it will be financing provided by the Vermont Housing Finance Agency using $9 million in state appropriations. Um, VHFA is hoping to make this a statewide program. There will be um, a number of utilities uh, hopefully filing uh, before the end of the calendar year, BED among them. Um, and we will also, if a customer comes forward and has a project um, with this scope, you know, bundle in heat pump or electrification um, improvements along with the weatherization. Um, and that would all be financed as one loan. A couple unique features of the program as proposed, the loan will follow the meter so that a subsequent homeowner would pick up, pick up the loan, a subsequent tenant would pick up the loan, um, and there will be uh, no disconnection for non-payment of the loan component of the bill. So um, I'll just cover the next slide. We'll sort of get into roles and responsibilities. So um, Energy Services, the EU portion of, of BED, would vet the project from an energy savings uh, <coughs> perspective and make sure it's you know, a good and reasonable project from an efficiency and organization perspective. HFA will be the ones setting the loan terms. They've indicated they haven't uh, picked a financing rate, but they expect it will be no more than 2% interest rate on these loans. And then VHFA will communicate to our billing department 
and finance department, you know, here's the customer, there's the loan amount, here's their payment amount, it's going to be paid off over this many months, and we would put the uh, charge, the on-bill financing charge sort of on the bill. And then um, we would be compensated for that service by the HFA with a one-time setup fee. And then there would also be uh, a monthly fee, part of the loan payment um, that would the customer would pay to, to cover our expenses for processing, right? Um, as the money comes in, as the customer pays their bill, right, we take the portion that's the loan payment, set it aside, and then re send that back to VHFA. So we're acting as the payment collector and processor for VHFA. The program will be filed and proposed uh, for PUC approval as a two-year pilot, uh, but the loans made under the pilot program could last up to 15 years. And so we could be servicing these loans even for a while, even if the pilot program is not extended or made permanent. Um, in your packet is a pretty detailed letter of support that VHFA drafted. Um, that The idea is that would accompany the, the PUC filing that we as the distribution utility would make that provides a lot of background on the legislative process that led to the, uh, to the, the financing, the state appropriation, as well as the discussions among uh, utilities and VHFA in designing the program and how it would work. So I'll, I'll, that's the overview, um, and I'll stop there, and the three of us are happy to take any questions. So it sounds like it's sort of like an ESCO kind of thing where so if I get my house weatherized and some of the loan will be paid for savings and energy, theoretically, right? Like I might pay $10 less a month. And so I can help subsidize the cost by lower energy. How does that work if you sell the property? Does it have to be paid off or can it be transferred into the new owner? It would be transferred. There's a, yeah, part of the program calls for a file to be made. I think that the local town clerk essentially right that it says that this there is a loan that is associated with this property that would be um, assumed by the new owner, the new buyer. I think this is a great idea. Um, you could also ask the same question about sort of global optimizations, but never mind. And this is the kind of stuff that was being thought about 40 years ago when utilities were being encouraged to sell energy services instead of energy. So it's a great idea. Um, I would ask uh, what kind of performance um, requirement or inspection is going to be a part of it? In other words, uh, will a job be evaluated by somebody outside of the contractor? So um, the way we envision this is all of the work is going to go through the normal EEU weatherization programs that are available today to Vermonters. So if you're a Vermont gas customer, um, you're going to want to take advantage of all the technical assistance and rebates and package that into your wrap loan um, because that's going to buy down your, your cost. But with that, you get the technical assistance, you get the um, contractor uh, um, help finding the right contractor, and you get inspection because the EEU, you know, is held to pretty rigorous measurement and verification of their savings. So because it's in the EEU program, it comes with a lot of protection to um, quality control protection. Um, this is not going to be another set of people or another set of contractors or energy auditors. It's all going to flow through the normal programs that are available to Vermont today. Sounds good. Related to that, before you scoot back, I would imagine, um, I mean, as we blend, you know, partial heating with gas and then with some heat pumps, that technical advisory group will figure out how the division works with I guess my question is normally you have to separate out the savings, right? From electric savings to gas savings. And how that's, is the loan going to have that separation out too in terms of VGS pro processes, some of them, Burlington Electric processes, some of them, the loans? It could be. I mean, we're still in early innings on that one, but we do envision, and in our work with the VGS team, VGS would handle 
the weatherization portion of the wrap, and if the if it was appropriate to heat pump uh, that same house, um, then BED could handle that portion. Also, propane and oil, right? And also propane and oil. <clears throat> where the where the heating fuel that's right. Is propane and oil, we would be doing the actual weatherization entity. Okay, so if it was just weatherization for a gas heated home, that would only be VGS. Absolutely. We would not touch it. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, our, our role would be to help promote it, yeah. you know, to all, to our shared customers. Okay. Um, and <laughs> the, the idea here is to try to help those folks that aren't qualified for the low income weatherization program um, and trying to help more, you know, low and moderate. So a market that both BED and Vermont Gas really want to be um, working on. And how does it work with VGS starting to now also offer heat pumps? Would they not offer heat pumps in the Burlington Electric territory? I think they only offer the heat pump water heaters right now. Right? Oh, okay. I don't think they actually offer... That is correct. Right, heat pump water heaters. So. That is correct. Okay. So many layers. Um, this is fantastic. It is so great. Uh, it, it's just great that this is actually happening. So good luck, because I'm sure it'll be really fun. Related to that, <laughs> I'm just, I interviewed a bunch of people down in Connecticut who had set up a on-bill financing program, and they said the customers love it, all the customers love it, but it's a lot of work. So related to that, um, how does BED pay for the administrative costs? As I mentioned before, um, there is a provision in the services agreement that we would execute with VHFA where we would receive a one-time setup fee for kind of that initial processing of adding the, the payment to the bill, and then a, a recurring monthly fee on each loan um, would also come to BED that the customer would pay for the monthly payment processing and, and transmittal of funds to VHFA. I didn't do that, sorry. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, developing the rules and regulations. I assume you guys have lots and lots of experts like weighing in on this and people who've been rolling these out in other states, presumably. Yes. Yeah, so, so the development, I, I believe, started with VHA, VHFA almost two years ago. And it started with BED staff and VGS staff that it morphed to bringing in all the utilities and efficiency Vermont. Um, so a whole lot of, of uh, investigation and planning has gone into the design. And lastly, um, there's a conclusion in this document that says VHFA would be pleased to address any questions or concerns regarding the program at a workshop held in concert with the DUs and program administrators. Do you know when that workshop is? No, I think that the idea is that that letter that's in your packet, it, that's a draft letter. It hasn't gone anywhere. That The idea is that would accompany a PUC filing. So we would make the filing with PUC that says we want to offer this on-bill weatherization program, and VHFA would attach their letter to say we support this filing and here's why. So a, that would so be that's a really workshop to be scheduled at the PUC's pleasure, I believe. Okay. All right. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Yeah, no, I think it looks great. Uh, I think the hardest part is going to be finding contractors, right, to do the work. But we put a lot of million dollars, many, many millions of dollars in via the legislature this past year for workforce development in the trades. So hopefully that'll help, not immediately, but at some point. Um, would anyone like to make a motion to approve? I move to approve. <laughs> Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 I know. I saw it in there. Do you want me to read that? Is that better? I'm oh. sure. That's far more professional, yes. I propose that the Burlington Electric Commission recommend to the Board of Finance and the City Council's approval of the weather, weatherization repayment assistance program wrap public utilities commission filing and distribution utility services agreement between BED, BED and VHFA subject to legal review. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. This will be great if you can keep us updated in terms of how it goes. Uh, so the next three uh, agenda items, uh, number 9, 10, and 11. Um, number 
I probably could probably screw that up. Sorry. Most not. not listed. It's, it's not. Okay. So number nine is airport arc wind turbine contract. This is a discussion and vote, but not executive session. We're having a little slight technical difficulties, as they say. Um, I'm used to doing this from home and not from here. <clears throat> so I'd like to touch base quickly with the Electric Commission on the ARC Pi Industries Pilot Program. But we are calling this an update because we have spoken to you before about this, and you guys have approved advancing this project once before. There have been some minor changes since we talked to you, and we thought it was prudent to bring it back to you again and make sure that you didn't have any issues with the proposal as it sits now. Just a quick reminder, the ARC Industries was a company out of the 2021 Delta Climb uh, mentoring cohort. Uh, it was one of the ones selected for a pilot by us. And it is a, ARC stands for Advanced Renewable Concept, and it's a essentially a roof-mounted wind turbine. It's a, about eight feet tall, so it's a six-foot ball with a two-foot stand. And you know we liked it because it was a chance to deploy something else alongside solar panels on roofs and potentially could share inverters with the solar panels as long as the two items weren't producing at the same time. So it had merit from being you know, some diversity for our roof-mounted generation in the city of Burlington. We did want to try to put it in, Bur in the downtown area. We were unable to do that. Um, right now, what we're talking about is we are looking at putting it at the airport. And the airport has been very helpful, very engaged. Uh, I'd like to make a point of thanking them for being flexible and working with us on this. Uh, we are currently authorized to enter a contract to deploy a wind turbine. There was difficulty locating the suitable pilot project location uh, for the pilot. I don't think it's necessary that it wouldn't work in Burlington, but for a pilot, we were having some real restrictions on what we could choose. We're going to need to amend the MOU that we have with the airport that allows us to use that area that you can see with the black panels for the solar array to allow us to add the arc in the area marked by the red X. Okay. So we're, we're coming outside of the footprint of the solar array a little bit, and the original MOU was very specific to solar equipment. But the airport is willing to consider an amendment to the MOU, and the MOU itself talked about major amendments for other things being possible. So it envisioned this. We think, though, a power supply contract would be better for the, the actual ARC agreement itself, the second phase agreement, because really what we're getting out of this is the energy from the plant while it's producing as well as information on energy production. And lastly, they have the right potentially to buy the plant out or the unit out at the end of the contract. So what we did was we split the contract into two agreements. We have a preparation agreement, with, which, was ex which we have executed in a long day. Uh, it is a one year or less term. It really is the site evaluation for you know, anemometer measurements, for you know, wildlife, things like that, and preparation work, where that work is permitted in the absence of a 248 permit. So some things are permitted before the 248 permit is issued. Some things are not. And that contract would have a maximum amount of 4,000. Just to remind folks what oh, section 248 is. 248 permit is a certificate of public good to produce or to build a generating unit in the state of Vermont. And that would cover anything from net metering to utility scale generation. Sorry about that. Um, we are proposing a second op operation and installation agreement that would actually take over from when we're ready to install the permit. BED would get the CPG, certificate of public good, for the array, and at that point, we'd be moving into the preparation of the installation contract. And that contract would cover from installation of the orb through decommissioning of the orb or through our taking over ownership of the orb at the end of the, of the operation period. The end of project options are still what we talked about the first time. Again, it would be either decommissioned or, or, or it could be extended or it could be bought out. The way we've drafted the contract is it could be extended up to five years because five years is the maximum power purchase agreement authority that the Electric Commission has. So what we're asking for is a motion to authorize the general manager to enter into a contract with ARC, committing the commercial terms described herein, to install and then receive power from one ARC turbine at the airport and seek supporting modifications of the MOU with the airport as needed to accomplish this. Again, this is a, just a 3KW turbine. This is not a major purchase by any stretch of the imagination. So the cost is to, to BED is that four thousand dollar maximum. It, the second contract is six thousand dollars. Covers it through decommissioning. If we choose to have it decommissioned, if we chose to purchase it, it would be an additional cost to actually purchase the unit and leave it operating at the airport. The power though comes free during the term of the agreement. So, in return for the running the pilot project and getting the data on roof-mounted wind turbines in our service territory, we also get the power, the energy, the racks, any capacity value. 
all of it for that second contract of six thousand dollars. So a total of ten thousand across Correct. the two contracts. Yes, that was the pilot, and that includes the PPA, whatever. Yeah. Um, Just because we restructured as a power contract, we thought we would come back to you for safety. And when you actually identify, uh, I mean, are. are if you're getting like normally, a, I'm I'm trying to imagine what a power contract is between BED and BED, um, <laughs> because like they own the equipment, but they don't. Uh, so normally, a power contract like you're negotiating with the company that owns the wind turbine. So in this context, they own the wind turbine for the duration of the contract that we're asking for approval for. There will be no charges to us other than the six thousand dollars I mentioned during that contract. During that contract period, we get the energy capacity recs and all for free. We share the data with them as to what the capabilities are of the unit. And then at the end of it, we can decide if it's economical to purchase that asset and continue its operation there, which would be a separate charge, and we'd have to bring that to you. And Or we can have them decommission it. And so if we do that, then the second contract takes us to where that roof has been restored to its pre-existing condition, this would be a fully ballasted. The other option, the other interesting thing about this is it's going to be ballasted. It's not going to be anchored to the roof. The airport does not like things anchored to the parking garage roof. So we're experimenting with a ballasted wind turbine. So, so let me try it one more time. That, that's helpful. But so my question is, um, basically, what we get per kilowatt hour from this turbine in terms of how much money we would get is based off of whatever the value, the market, that Correct. instant market value is for and how much it actually produces. There isn't this, this is the first unit. This, there's none of these installed anywhere. So it's not like, you know, we have their estimated wind production, but we don't know. Yeah. So again, it truly is a pilot of a, of a prototype technology that would be first occurring in Burlington. R&D project. R&D project. Cool. Yeah. Maybe the first new wind project in Vermont in how many years? Yeah. Maybe the only wind, new wind project in Vermont in how many years? So, Just saying. Um, so again, you know, we certainly think it has merit alongside roof-mounted solar. Plus F-35s might spin it, too. <laughs> no comment. Um, okay, I, I, I was, I guess, a bit critical previously, and I, I still am. Uh, this was um, sold or pitched as something that would not necessarily go on a big windswept roof, such as the airport, but would go on my roof. Uh, a commercial property roof was the original intent. Okay, well, all right. Uh, you said three kilowatts, which means if it works like big windmills, that's like one kilowatt average continuous. Um, anyway, I guess my objection is I, I wonder where it's going to go if it works at the airport, if there are that many places where it will go. Um, and also, it seems a little chancy to assume that three kilowatt, uh, kilowatts will translate into one kilowatt um, average. I know they haven't said that, but I guess we, we have to make some assumption about that. It's going to be close to the ground and so on and so on. Um, so what are the odds that it's going to work and you're going to replace them? Do people want them if they do work? Well, that's kind of the intent of a pilot project is to answer those questions in my mind. I mean, again, you know, we're not proposing a broad-based program. We're not proposing to incentivize these. We're proposing to deploy one of them and see if the claims are accurate and if it has viability. Well, okay. I mean, I think I like research, but is there a way to... Uh, to sort of back of the envelope calculation and some other thoughts that might say already we have a sense of what we can and can't do. And I'm particularly uh, interested in the siting question. Well, there's a big question about the siting because right now the Vermont permitting rules for rooftop arrays are all revolving around solar. So we're going to have to ask for a waiver, among other things, we're going to have to ask for a waiver of the normal permitting conditions. We've been in communication with the PUC about that, and we hope to file as soon as we can to actually seek a waiver of those conditions. The PUC was amenable to that discussion, but part of it's going to be, you know, what is the permitting involved in one of these things, too? Well, I wonder what the spot used then for their, uh, the spot on Shelburne Road, the restaurant, because they have a... I don't know anything about that or that turbine, frankly. Yeah. I mean, presumably they went through a permit <laughs> process. <laughs> I, I don't know that. Is that, yeah. is that still operating? 
I don't know that. I don't ever see it spin. <laughs> but. Because we, we didn't find it had to give up on our own turbine. Uh, no, we, we haven't. We have not given up on our, our turbine, by the way. We have a contract to repower that. It, a while ago, but I know that the the uh, the Pecos. the yeah the the steps to actually get the equipment has been delayed. Yeah, correct. And, but I that that was maybe like a year and a half ago or two years ago. But yes, we we did we did vote to support that. Um, and I'll just say for this uh, personally, as someone who like headed up a renewable energy technology uh, trade association. I just, I, I, because R and D is important, I support this, but I generally, I mean, every single roof mounted turbine has not, or, or close to the ground or near bunches of buildings has not really been a great producer of energy in terms of, you know, the return on investment, but let's see how it goes. It's $10,000. Let's see how it goes. Right. And it is, again, it was a pilot selected by the, Bur the Burlington Electric Department, you know, management after talking to all of the people that went through the, R the Delta Climb project program in 2021. So. OK, just let me uh, do another my own back of it. I'm a little cut for this. Is it 6K or 10K total we're talking about? In dollars. $10,000. OK. And if the thing really. Uh, will produce one kilowatt continuous. That's something like nine megawatt hours, $10,000, which I think is a pretty good deal. Depends upon your markets these days. But again, the, the buyout is an unknown. You know, the duration is an unknown. That's a one year analysis. You know, again, I'm not disputing it, but again, it's it's a pilot project and a part of our, our mission here is to is to push some of these envelopes and test new things so yeah so i mean again i feel very much like it, in the pilot project i don't look for it to pencil out on the bottom line to bo greater than zero or you don't do it if you're doing that it's a program you already know it's going to be economical or have a strong belief it's going to be economical this is a pilot to see if it has merit i should just also mention that under our act 151 filing with the puc uh, we've specifically, I think, put aside funds to support the Delta Climb pilots, uh, which are right. every year we do typically two pilots. Uh, sometimes we've done three um, and we support the companies with a $10,000 demonstration grant, essentially, to, to do something with us or with our customers that would have some value. So um, if that's approved, we will have a yeah. different source of funding for this than operating funds. Yeah. But we do have an R&D budget in operating funds as well. In, in addition. Yeah. In addition. So there's there's. There's funds that were intended for this purpose. And so just to sum up, $10,000 for potentially the five year, um, or is this just for one year? If it's if it's extended, there's no cost during the extension. So if we decide that there's merit to extending it and they're willing to extend it, then it would just be extended operationally. But it can't go past five years because right. no. there's only the approval under a power purchase agreement for a five year type of arrangement. If we went tried to go past five years, we'd need to get a different structure. Right, but so we are investing ten thousand dollars, assuming this moves forward, and uh, the assumption would be that uh, we would get the power, uh, any other valuable ancillary benefits for up to five years with that initial. One year is the, what we can count on. It's extendable to five years with both parties' acceptance. Okay, and we have that we will negotiate a buyout at the end. But obviously, again, they could put a buyout number there, but without knowing the production, right. it wouldn't With, do much yep. for us. Okay. Well, I mean, I, commissioners, how do you feel? I, um, I, we supported this in the past. I, I think I appreciate you coming back with it. They are, they are changes, so it's, it's appreciated that you're coming back to us. Personally, as I said, I, uh, I'll see. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be psyched if it actually comes back with some good generating numbers. But it is ten thousand dollars, and we do need um, other solutions in the toolbox. Um, besides so. rooftop solar. I'm going to vote no, so I should kind of encapsulate my, my argument. Um, they're not talking about making this in, uh, to scale this up in size, so it's a small rooftop. <coughs> 
And I just can't imagine lots of these around in a congested area. Okay, I'll make a motion. Okay. Um, I motion to authorize the general manager to enter into a contract with ARC containing the commercial terms described herein to install and receive power from one ARC wind turbine at the airport and to seek supporting modifications of the MOU with the airport as needed to accomplish this. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And not in favor? Mm. And I didn't say aye, but I'm in favor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now. <laughs> uh, the next two agenda items, agenda item number 10, IT forward project update. Uh, this is a discussion which relates to an expected executive session. And then also agenda item number 11, a cybersecurity update. Uh, both of these uh, are updates on con contractual items and vendor negotiations. Um, and so uh, it does make sense to shift into executive session. Um, we're assuming that cybersecurity update uh, should also be held in executive session uh, due to proprietary information. Uh, so ideally, we would make it a motion to enter into executive session for both of these items um, instead of separately. Uh, and I think you have the language for that. Just before we do that, if you if I may, I am prepared to give some of the IT forward update in public session. Let's that do that then. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Okay. Thank you. Great. And um, I also want to introduce in person Erica Fernland, our director of IT, to join us in January. Yay. Yay, indeed. <laughs> okay. So, um, it's been some time since we have given you the commission a more detailed update on IT Forward. Uh, my team, I think, has been providing updates every month in the monthly report as the project has gone on. But um, with Erica joining and having been here for six months, we felt it was a good time. And also just in the, the progression of the projects was a good time to give the commission an update on how those projects were going and, and where we stand. So just a, a reminder for everyone about what IT Forward means. That's been the sort of internal label that BED has used for uh, really what's a collection of projects to replace our core business systems, uh, five of them and one, two, three, four of them. Um, first, the meter data management system. This is the sort of database that stores our smart meter AMI data after it's collected and uh, does the math, so to speak, to determine what the bills, what should be billed. Um, so that's, that's that, the first one. And the, all of the, as you recall, all of the vendors are part of the Harris Utilities uh, Corporation. Um, so these are different subsidiary units of, of Harris Utilities. So the meter data management system we've selected is called MeterSense uh, by SmartWorks. Next is our customer web portal that's being replaced with a product called Silverblaze, also part of the Harris family. Next, the customer information system, which we've selected CIS Infinity. And then the FIS, along with payroll and work and asset management system, where we've selected Cogsdale Financials and WMS. So, uh, I just wanted to, at a very high level, let you know that since the commission approved us um, moving forward to execute a contract with Harris in December 2020, the overall timeline for the sequencing of those major implementations has changed a little bit, um, sort of through mutual agreement between ourselves and Harris as we talked through what made sense in terms of how to sequence these. So unchanged is that the MDM and the portal have remained the first priority and where we started. Uh, the reason being is that those, both of those systems are um, 
sort of a running on the original MDM and original portal that we stalled, coincident with the AMI system, which went live in 2013 or 14, um, and, and proved difficult and expensive to upgrade, which really was the impetus for this whole IT forward um, initiative. Initially, we were, going to, we were thinking that we were going to do the FIS next, um, a second phase of the portal, and then the CIS, and then wrap up the MDM and the portal. The MDM and the, and the portal have multiple phases because they connect to multiple systems. So um, the MDM connects to the CIS in order to generate bills. So you have to implement it now, connect it to the existing CIS, and then if you replace the CIS, you have to do another phase to connect it to the new CIS and make sure that it works, right? Um, and then finally, the staking. So that was the original plan, MDM portal, FIS, CIS. Uh, after sort of thinking about it more and talking with Harris, we've changed that plan so that instead of doing the FIS next after the MDM and portal, it really makes more sense to do the CIS. Um, that allows us to wrap up and complete the MDM and portal like in a shorter period of time. So you're not going back you know, years later, you're going back months later. Um, and the CIS is really where a lot of the sort of value proposition for the project, for the whole IT Forward initiative falls into place in terms of being able to support innovative rate designs with a more flexible and robust billing system. And so the longer we wait to replace that CIS, the, you know, the harder it becomes or the longer we have to wait in order to bill those kinds of rates efficiently, um, which is what we want to be able to do. And how does the CIS relate or not relate to the RAP um, proposal of on-bill it's it's not a yeah the the limitations of our current software are not really a limitation in terms of being able to do wrap. Okay. Yeah. So that's the the current project timeline in terms of sequencing. So then I'm going to talk now um, just a little bit more in detail about the status of the MDM project, the status of the portal project, and the status of the CIS project, which is the one we sort of have queued up on deck, so to speak. So the MeterSense MDM implementation is in progress. It kicked off in March 2021, um, just a few months after we last uh, came to the commission for the contract approval. Um, we have a go-live target of October 2022, so this fall. Um, it's basically, I would say, I remember the original timeline, it's about a year behind schedule. So I think it was originally projected to go live in October 2021. We're now looking at October 2022. Why is that? A few reasons. Uh, primarily, I would say two. Um, one is, you know, we had a substantial IT staff turnover last summer and fall, which was a major slowdown. Uh, we were able to maintain forward progress, um, but it definitely slowed things down. And then the second major sort of challenge or risk to the project that I'll mention, um, it was the third party vendor integrations. So the MDM has to connect to the AMI to be able to bring in the smart meter data, has to connect to the CIS to feed the billing data. Um, and in both of those cases, you know, we're not in charge and SmartWorks isn't in charge. Our AMI and CIS vendors are in charge, right? And so um, making sure that those vendors made resources available, were committed to the project, had a timeline that met our timeline, um, was those were identified very early on as likely sources of risk. And sure enough, they have been sources of risk to the project. Um, and then thirdly, uh, we have not backfilled any positions to, to make this project happen. Everyone is, is, that's involved in the project is doing this work, you know, in addition to their regular job as a, uh, you know, billing analyst um, or IT person or um, energy services engineer or what have you, right? So having staff resources being able to do a project on top of their regular jobs um, is a challenge. 
all of that said, SmartWorks has been great to work with. Um, they've been flexible. We've been flexible as the project has experienced you know, surprises, delays, risks. Um, both teams have been working together very well, communicating well, and kind of figuring out, okay, well, if that part is stuck and we can't move that, then what else can we do in the meantime to keep forward progress going? Um, oh. <laughs> um, whoops, I advanced the slides. There we are. Welcome back, Commissioner Herendy. Um, so that partnership has been good, and that's been, um, you know, really critical to uh, being able to keep going despite the challenges that we've been facing. And then the third thing I'll mention is that we spent a good amount of time with SmartWorks establishing the statement of work from the very beginning, and that's been that was proved to be time well spent because the scope that we've arrived at, uh, you know, prior to March 2021, is really where the scope is today. There hasn't been surprises. Um, there haven't been things that have been uncovered where they went, oh, you didn't say that, or oh, that's not what we thought. Um, so, th so that is that's that's been a, a a good aspect of the project. Silver Blaze Portal. Uh, this kicked off in April 2021, so just a month after the MDM has the same go live target. Reason being is that the customer portal is where folks can. Um, their bill, but also where they can see their smart meter data. If they're interested in what my usage look like last week, so that the portal receives data from the MDM. So when we replace the MDM, we really want to replace the portal as close to the same time as possible, so that it's sort of seamless for the customers and there's not a, a data drop, so to speak, in terms of the interval data that customers can access online. Um, the Silverblaze portal is a bit of a different story. Um, the payments integration, kind of getting accounts set up, uh, we're, we're going to work so that everyone who has an existing account in the current portal will get moved over as seamlessly as possible to the new portal and then we'll, you know just create a new password. So all of that work um, has gone great. Where we've run into some challenges with this project is in the presentation of that smart meter data and the build data and how to make things like uh, time of use rates, um, demand charges, net metering, kind of some of the more complicated customer and meter situations, how to make that appear in a graphical user-friendly way that's understandable. Um, and as it happens, you know, the customers with the most sort of complicated electricity situation are the ones most likely to want to see their data on the portal, right? <laughs> um, if you're kind of a routine customer and has kind of regular usage that doesn't vary much, it's, you know, not less exciting to log in to see what happened last week. Um, so we, we went to Silverblaze with some concerns about that. Um, they have been very responsive, I'm pleased to say. Um, so we have um, sort of re-engaged with them in terms of restating requirements, and they've come forward with solutions, uh, which, has, which has been you know, well received by our team. And then finally, the CIS. So we are really in the scoping and planning stages here. Um, we have not executed a notice to proceed. We have not committed to, to a kickoff. Um, we are finalizing the statement of work. We just started uh, conversations with Harris last week on kind of revisiting the statement of work. We did probably 80% of it you know, prior to March 2021, and then we kind of left the rest until now. Um, and in preparation for that, um, we've engaged uh, the consultants that have been helping us with project management, um, have worked with teams throughout BED to map all of the business processes that relate to the CIS. So we have a very clear understanding of what we need the system to do, uh, which will then translate into very clear requirements for the statement of work, which then hopefully translates into very clear expectations for what we need the system to do, which 
hopefully will then translate into a clear understanding from Harris about what they need to do to meet those expectations. And I believe that was my, my last slide in, uh, in public session. And I think Lori has provided um, some potential motion text for you. Yes, and just as a reminder, because the next two agenda items, IT Forward and uh, Cybersecurity Update, uh, relates to contractual items, vendor negotiations, and proprietary information, um, that's why we're shifting into executive session. Anyone want to make a motion? I've been making a sure. lot. No, so okay. Go ahead. Your turn. Okay. I move to find that premature general public knowledge regarding the contractual uh, items and vendor negotiations related to BD's IT forward project would clearly place B Burlington Electric Department at a substantial disadvantage per Title I, Section 313A1 of the Vermont Statutes. Okay. All in favor. Aye. 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 And then? I move to find that disclosure of priority information related to the cybersecurity plan could jeopardize public safety per Title I, Section 313A10 of Vermont statutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And before you make the third one, um, the last thing we have on this agenda is commissioner's check-in. Uh, um, does it make sense to have everybody wait and then come back or? Well, you're going to be here, so we have to leave. Right. So he can't pick up. Okay. okay. All right. Third motion. I make the motion to enter into executive session with Burlington Electric Department staff to discuss the contractual items in vendor negotiations related to BD's IT forward project and to discuss BD priority cybersecurity plan. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, so we just exited executive session at 8.02 uh, and uh, appreciate the hard work from our IT team very much. Um, Erica and Emily, both of you, as well as your folks that work with Erica. Um, the last item on the agenda is agenda item number 12. It's the commissioner's check-in. Uh, the one thing I have on the list is to loop back to whether or not we think we need an August meeting. Um, for me, the one piece that I thought might have percolated was the lighting piece, but I think we have a game plan for that for September. Um, and uh, personally, I'm, I think it's all right if we do not meet in August. I don't know how others feel. No, I agree. I agree? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I don't think we need to make a vote on that. We just will not meet. Is there anything else uh, folks would like to weigh in for the commissioner's check-in? Uh, just thanks for the accommodation tonight. Thank you for joining. All right, so uh, just the one other piece, if anything comes up, uh, reach out to us since we won't be meeting in August. And otherwise, I think we can have a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody.